You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, is your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we.
morning and welcome to the river. Uh, my name is Dean Ward and I serve as the lead pastor of the River Church. And I am so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us here this morning on this Palm Sunday. Now, as you know, we don't film on Palm Sunday. Uh, we film a few days before, and it's Thursday afternoon, and it's cold as can be. Uh, don't let the sun fool you. Uh, We're in full Carhartt gear to stay warm during this sermon, and I hope that uh, your lead up to Easter has been a meaningful time in your life. I hope that you've been able to connect here online and I would love to invite you in person at the river on Easter Sunday. Uh, I would love it if you could join us a week from today at 9.15 or 10.45, one of our morning services. We're going to have a great Easter service together. And today we're going to have a great Palm Sunday service together, but it was four weeks ago that we preached the Palm Sunday message. So today, uh, we're going to start a little bit after Palm Sunday in the life of Christ, the last week during his time in Jerusalem. Today, we're going to be looking at the events that occurred on Good Friday. So I just want to ask, have you ever noticed when you're on a long trip and you're almost home, how hard and challenging the last hour uh, is of the trip. You're like so close you can taste it, but it's taking forever. Uh, my wife and I used to live in Mississippi, so we would drive the 13-hour drive if you don't stop only but once for gas, uh, 800 miles back and forth. And we would do really good until we were about an hour and a half away from home either way. And then it was like, I'm not sure I can make it. And we would try. I remember one time we were coming back from a beach vacation in our van with our four children, much younger. And we were about 45 minutes away from home. And we reached New Stanton. And growing up in Delmont, you would get off in New Stanton and go to Delmont. But now I live in New Kensington. Uh, it's about six of one, half dozen of another. You could get off and go to Delmont and come the back way, or you can stay on the turnpike. We talked, which way do we want to go? We said, let's just stay on the turnpike because you can drive a little bit faster on the turnpike. So we were driving on the turnpike so close to home, somewhere between the Irwin and Monroeville interchange, traffic came to a complete stop. And do you know what the problem with that was? We're on the turnpike. <laughs> There's no turning around, there's no U-turns, there's no back way, you're stuck on the turnpike. I remember thinking, I chose very poorly. <laughs> no escape, interrupted, delayed, my plans did not work out as I wanted. Today in our sermon, we're going to look at one whose plans did not work out they were interrupted and we're also going to look at the perfect sacrifice that changed everything uh, we are in part 14 of our sermon series just called the way we're looking at the way of jesus as it's described in the gospel of mark and today we're looking at uh, the sermon title is just perfect sacrifice we're looking at the perfect sacrifice. Now, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 gives us the whole synopsis of this book in one verse. It says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, in this series, we've been looking at a key verse heading into the sermon. And this week's key verse is in Hebrews 10 verse 14 it says for by one sacrifice he has made us perfect for uh, he has made sorry let's try that again hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy now, the scripture we're going to read today, let me give you just a little context of how it's going to go. Sometimes I 
start reading the scripture and then I make some points and then I read the scripture and I make a point and I read the scripture. Well, today we're going to read through the entire scripture and then we're going to bring out the points. Okay, so here we go. Mark chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 15, but land on verse 21. Pilate, who had Jesus flogged and handed him over... Let's try it again. Verse 15. Pilate had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now, the other gospel accounts hold this story as well, and they mention Jesus' complete and utter exhaustion and his inability to carry his own cross. And so they grab Simon of Cyrene and say, uh, now you have to carry his cross because he has to get to his ultimate destination where we will crucify him. It says they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Now, our campus pastor at the River Franklin Park, uh, Pastor Mark Kelsel, he went to Israel a couple of times a few years ago, and he brought me back this image, and it's a 1900 photograph, and it's called Gordon's Calvary. And this photograph shows this formation of a skull on the side of the cliff out of stone. So uh, you can see it in the image that we have uh, zoomed in for you there. And many believe that this was the hill outside of Jerusalem that Christ was brought to be crucified. And it always fascinates me when I hear they... Um, Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Well, perhaps that is why. Verse 23. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him, the written notice on the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe." This is a story that perhaps you have heard many times. And as we look at this story, uh, the five days before Good Friday, I, I want to point out that indeed Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. I'm going to try to flip one of my sermon note pages, which uh, was not done very successfully in the parking lot. Uh, the paper started to blow away with a gust of wind. Matt and I were running through the parking lot, looking like elementary school children trying to step on these papers before they got blown away. But I do want to read two passages of Scripture that just say very succinctly and clearly how Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. First uh, Peter chapter two verse twenty four says, "He himself bore our sins 
in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says it this way. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice for our transgressions. He is the savior of the world. He is the spotless, pure lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the one who knew no sin and became sin for us so that you and I can be made righteous in God's eyes. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. And in Christendom, we celebrate the power of the cross because that is where it took place. Uh, we celebrate this object, <laughs> this icon, this uh, design feature. <laughs> but it is much more powerful than that. It is much more than just ink to be tattooed on our arm. It is much more than just an emblem to be worn around our neck. We celebrate this cross. And so I want to take a moment and give each of us the opportunity to just take in the glory and the power of the cross in this video just simply called this is the cross it was designed to punish it was created to kill it was meant to showcase earthly power on the side of a hill it was wood and rope. It was hammer and nails. It was degradation, then death. And it never failed. It was chosen to stop the Christ, to erase the message he taught. It was the bitter end of Jesus. At least, that's what they thought. It was intended to defeat, to put down, to make the disciples give up, but instead it became the symbol of God's love. The icon of death became the icon of true living. What once marked the end is now the mark of the beginning, a mark of forgiveness, of new life, of new birth. What began at Calvary now covers the earth over cities, over hospitals, through the streets, through homes. The picture of God's sacrifice is our picture of hope, the lasting image of our Savior and salvation's great cost. This is more than a symbol. This is the cross. Uh, I hope that video really connected you with the power of the cross of Jesus Christ and the ability to celebrate how it's everywhere. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. So I want to kind of look at this story and look how Jesus, as our perfect sacrifice, uh, makes things happen. Uh, first of all, it's quite apparent at the very beginning of this story in verse 21 uh, to note that Jesus 
interrupts. Jesus is an interrupter, and Jesus interrupts plans perfectly. We call these divine interruptions. Uh, Simon, heading into Jerusalem to observe the Passover from he was coming. Cyrene is in Egypt. He had an extremely long journey to get to Jerusalem. He's within eyesight of it. He can see the city. And because of Jesus, his plans are interrupted. These divine interruptions can affect the course of the rest of your life. I have a dear friend in the early 90s that was on vacation with her husband and a group of friends. I believe they had gone uh, to the island somewhere in the Caribbean and uh, they flew back and landed in Miami and their flight came much earlier than they thought it was and they realized that there was an earlier flight back to Pittsburgh. And so they went to the ticket agent back when you could do all this kind of stuff at the airport and they got their flight changed to the earlier flight it was several hours earlier and they got their luggage on the flight they got their boarded they got everything ready to go and my friend said guys i'm not going on that flight and they're like what what do you mean and she said look i'm so close to south beach uh, I want to go shopping in South Beach. I want to eat in South Beach. That's why we plan for this later flight. We're not, I am not flying back on this early flight. I'm staying and flying back on our original flight. And the friends were about to lose their mind because they just wanted to get home. And she said, you go if you want. I'm staying. Her husband and her said, we're going to stay. Well, their entire group of six changed their plans back to fly on the later flight that they were originally booked for, but they went ahead and had their suitcases go because they were going to end up in Pittsburgh anyways. So they went to dinner, they went shopping, and my friend told me it was the most miserable time they had. Hours of their friends being angry at them, frustrated with them, filled just so annoyed at them. Well, they got to the airport to fly home, and it was at some point during their stay at the airport that they learned that the flight that they were to fly home on earlier they, that day, the flight with their luggage was the value jet flight that crashed in the Florida Everglades. And if this divine interruption did not come in their lives, my friend and her husband and their group of friends would have died in that flight. Now, I, I, I say that to say that whenever our plans get interrupted, sometimes God's up to something divine. Sometimes he's up to something that we can't see and won't immediately appreciate. Simon the home stretch of coming from Africa, Jerusalem, he was interrupted. He was told to pick up his cross and carry it. Now, my original plan was to pick up this cross, put it on my shoulder, and try to preach the last half of this sermon with the cross on my shoulder, showing this interruption and carrying the cross. But the more I thought about it, it felt maybe a little corny. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that cross weighs about 150 pounds. I don't want to stand here with a 150-pound cross on my shoulder. So we'll just imagine Pastor Dean is carrying this cross, or hopefully we can imagine Simon of Cyrene carrying a cross like this. Simon carried Christ's cross because Jesus was too weak to carry his own cross, while Jesus, <laughs> too weak to carry the cross, was about something much greater, saving our souls. Simon doesn't know it, but he's coming face to face 
with the greatest moment in his life. Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. I wonder, was Jesus visualizing Simon of Cyrene carrying his cross when he spoke these words to his followers? Simon of Cyrene literally did this, picked up Jesus' cross, and followed Jesus. Jesus interrupts plans perfectly. Secondly, I want you to pay attention how Jesus changes our direction. <laughs> Simon had to change the direction he was going. He was so close, and then he had to turn around per order of the soldiers and go the other direction. And not just go the other direction, but go the other direction carrying a cross of great weight. Divine interruptions take you in a different direction, don't they? They don't feel divine when they occur. To identify yourself with the perfect sacrifice, it will take you in a different direction. Your life will be different when it intersects with Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And one would be skeptical if you claimed to, <laughs> to meet Jesus and your life didn't go in a different direction. I want to invite you to come close to Jesus the perfect sacrifice, and allow him to change you. And many people, they miss out on this. They stay their distance from God and Jesus because they know that it will require their life to be different than it currently is. They don't particularly want to be changed. I don't know if Simon particularly wanted to be changed. But he was. He was so close to Jesus. Uh, Simon would have been literally covered in the blood of Jesus as Jesus' blood was about to provide for his salvation. He seemed to be G saving Jesus as Jesus was saving him. It is hard to be this close to Jesus and not be changed. Now you may be saying, Dean, why are you saying Simon was, was saved by Jesus? We, we don't know that for sure. Well, kind of an interesting thing to point out. In Acts chapter 11, uh, it mentions men from Cyrene going to Antioch and telling the Greeks about Jesus. And many of the Greeks believed in Jesus. Many scholars believe that Simon was among those evangelizing. Simon's sons are mentioned in Mark, Alexander and Rufus. Now, it feels a little out of place, doesn't it? I mean, whenever it says, um, if I can find where it says it, <laughs> right at the beginning, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Uh, now, that, that just sounds like uh, silly, unnecessary information. Why are we learning this information about Simon and Rufus? Well, it's likely very intentionally placed there by Mark to note to the believers who would be reading this gospel that Rufus and Alexander were there with their father when Jesus was going to his crucifixion. Romans chapter 15, in the final greetings of the book of Romans, Rufus's name is mentioned. 
Well, let's speculate for just a moment. If his sons are mentioned because there's, they are believers, let's go down the road of the man who carried the cross for Jesus. Something in that moment happened to him. When you are that close to Jesus, it is hard not to be changed by him. Was there something that happened in that moment to Simon that changed his life and the life of his two children forever? Simon rescued Jesus while Jesus was rescuing Simon and his kids. The third thing I want to point out is that Jesus offers salvation to all. Jesus, our perfect sacrifice, offers salvation to all. Simon, he was covered with the blood of Jesus before he was covered by the blood of Jesus. And what's interesting is when we read this account, we see all the bad behavior going on by so many people and think, well, they were the enemies of Christ. They are the bad people that really needed to be saved. But actually, both Simon and those who were behaving very badly needed to be rescued and saved by Jesus. And as the perfect sacrifice, he offers salvation to us all, regardless of our past, regardless of how we have behaved. The soldiers were mocking him after they had been abusing him and beating him. They were gambling for his clothes. How insensitive. He's hanging on a cross. His mother and John are there at the foot of the cross grieving and these soldiers are casting lots, playing a game to see who will win the purple garment that they put on Jesus, even though it too would have been stained with blood. They were on crucifixion duty. They lightened the toll of their job by numbing the experience, by making sport of it, making a game of it. Gambling would get the trinkets left behind by their victims. Religious people were hurling insults at Jesus. Chief priests and teachers of the law were mocking him. Those crucified with him also mocked him. The cross, it has been said, is God at his best and humanity at its worst. These people are who Jesus came for. And I and you and others, you and I fit in that category as well. People at their worst. Jesus loved these enemies of him who were crucifying him. Jesus' life was summed up in this one statement that they were using to taunt him with on the cross. He saved others, but could not save himself. And in reality, in their mocking, they, they got it right. He did save others by not saving himself. Their mocking shows just really how blind they were, blinded by their own envy and prejudices. Simon carried the cross because of Jesus' physical weakness as Jesus was carrying Simon's spiritual weakness. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Jesus is in the business of saving lives. Jesus is in the business of transforming the condition of the human heart. Jesus is in the business of making what's broke and sinful and lost holy and restored to him. 
Finally, I want to point out that Jesus, Jesus calls us to sacrifice. He says in John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. There is no greater love. There is nothing greater than when someone sacrifices their life for someone else. Without sacrifice, there is no victory. Sacrifice moves us. We benefit from Christ's perfect sacrifice, so we are called to live a life of sacrifice, to pick up our cross and walk with Jesus. Simon of Cyrene, he got to do this literally in the flesh. This perfect sacrifice has done everything perfectly. My effort is not necessary. I don't have to worry, fret, or wonder if his sacrifice is enough or if I have done enough. His sacrifice is perfect. Accept it. Receive it. It's for free. Our perfect sacrifice, Jesus, provides freedom. The freedom is to go and live a life free and forgiven. Now we live a life of sacrifice. Sacrifice leads to life in all of its fullness. Self-indulgence does not lead to freedom. Sacrifice leads to freedom. This is the kingdom where everything seems and feels backwards than what you think at the moment. Last week, I talked about how suffering is the entry point. It is, it is the uh, conduit to life in all of its fullness, to, to real life, going through suffering, feeling that, experiencing that. Well, this week, we learn that sacrifice leads to life in all of its fullness. In a culture of indulgence, we are invited by God to find new life in his sacrifice and then learn to live a life of sacrifice. We are the beneficiaries of Christ's sacrifice. How is the Lord asking you to sacrifice? You won't always get it right. <laughs> Today I was driving uh, on uh, Freeport Road and right in front of Golden Dawn, there was a car right in the middle of the road and the guy's arm was sticking out, waving people to go by and his flashers were on. And so I pulled up next to him, rolled my window down. I said, are you okay? And he looked at me with a dumbfounded look on his face like, and then he said, I don't speak English. I'm like, oh, this is going to take a little more effort. This is going to be an interruption. So I got out of my car. I, I parked in the Golden Dawn parking lot, got out of my car. By that time, he had drifted back into uh, uh, the shoulder of the road, off the middle of the road, and got out of his car, but his flashers were still on. So I realized, um, man, he doesn't speak English. He had dark uh, dark hair. I know that uh, there's the restaurant here, uh, the Mexican restaurant here, and I'm like, I see a lot of people that work there. I'm like, okay. So I got my Google Translate out, and I went from English to Spanish, and I said, is someone coming to help you? And it translated into Spanish, and I showed it to him, and he just looked so confused. And then he took his phone and spoke something in it and showed it to me, and I was so confused. I couldn't tell. I'm like, what is happening here? And then he said, Russian. I'm like, oh. So then I went from, from English to Russian, and I said, is someone coming to help you? And I put it, and I saw it was in Russian. I showed it to him. He read it. And he goes, oh, yeah, good, good. <laughs> and just then somebody pulled up and was giving him a hand. 
That was a silly interruption, an attempt to sacrifice some time to help somebody, and I didn't get it right. I don't know how I confused a Russian and thought he was a Spanish-speaking person. I have no idea. But I was willing to stop, willing to say, God, if you want to use me in this moment, I'm available to you. So I just want to invite you today to come to terms with the perfect sacrifice that was made for you. Have you accepted God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ? Have you prayed and asked him to come into your life, asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you received his free gift of salvation and stopped trying to be good enough to deserve it? Because none of us are. Have you become a child of God through Christ's perfect sacrifice. If not, today is the perfect day for you to give your life to Christ. Pray to him, invite him in, ask him to forgive you, give your life to him. And then once you do, we get to pick up our cross and follow him and serve and bless and help and sacrifice And this is the way of Jesus. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for joining in with us today. I hope you have a great Good Friday, and I can't wait to get this till I get to see you on Easter Sunday. God bless you, everybody. When I serve.